Um, so this is the second webinar we've done. Uh, today's speaker is Svan Gu. He's a professor at the National Center for Asphalt Technology. Um, but first, just want to talk about the webinar, webinar program. Um, so uh, this is kind of a spinoff of the, uh, the minor we've created at Auburn. Um, and a gentleman named Ralph Beard was an integral part of this. Uh, there's a, a fund at Auburn set up for him uh, that provides scholarships for students. Uh, so if you're interested in supporting the minor, that's a good way to, to do that. Um, so this webinar will be uh, the first Tuesday of each month at 1 p.m. Central Time. And we're going to at least try to keep it up um, for this year. And depending on how successful it is, we'll keep going uh, next year as well. Uh, next month, um, the first Tuesday will be uh, presenting will be uh, Professor Ali Erdemir. Um, and he'll talk about super lubricity and vanishing friction. Um, he's now a professor at uh, Texas A&M, but previously he was at Argonne National Lab. And he's a fellow of the National Academy of Engineering and uh, he's pretty well known in the area. And so it'll be more of a fundamental um, exploration of, of tribology and friction. And I'll, I'll send more information about that after, after this webinar. Um, just a little bit about the academic programs. Um, so we have a minor, it's, it's uh, aimed toward undergraduate students. That's what I think makes us unique. It takes 15 hours of uh, extra, extra work for students to receive the minor. Uh, here's a website with more information. Um, if you look up tribology minor on Google, we're usually the first thing that, that comes up. Uh, we also create a graduate certificate uh, for uh, people off campus. So if you're working and you want to uh, gain more background in tribology, there's a graduate certificate you, you can obtain. And there's more information about there. And that's all online, the graduate certificate. Um, we have a board, an industrial advisor board. They're really the ones who have uh, uh, put this or, or came with this idea of, uh, of the webinar. Um, Raj Shaw and Maureen Hunter are, are the main people behind this. Um, but the, we have lots of people with lots of experience in this field uh, of the help to give us feedback of what the, the industry is looking for. And that's uh, really what um, started the minor. Here's some of our supporters, really appreciate them. They've helped support through scholarships or, or funds for the students. All right, so um, today's speaker, I have two introductions. The main speaker is gonna be Dr. Fangu. He's an assistant professor, assistant research professor at the National Center for Asphalt Technology. Uh, he earned his PhD from Texas A&M University and he specialized in asphalt pavement, des pavement design and asphalt material characterization. He's authored more than 60 publications. Uh, he also serves on a commit as a committee member of the uh, transport Res Transportation Research Board, AKM80, and uh, an academic editor of the Advances in Civil Engineering. Uh, in 2017, he was awarded the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship by the European Commission, and uh, that's a prestigious recognition for young professionals. Um, Michael Heitzman, uh, former Assistant Director of, of uh, the Center, will also be available for questions. Um, he served as the bituminous uh, materials engineer uh, for the Iowa DOT for nine years. Um, the first 18 years of his career, he was a highway engineer with the FHWA. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of Washington and Iowa. And Dr. Heitzman is a national expert in pavement friction and has a leading role in developing and implementing national friction standards. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson, for your introduction. and. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, webinar. I'm going to talk about wear and degradation of asphalt pavement surfaces. Can you hear me pretty well? Okay. Yes, you're good. Um, so when you, when you see a car is running on the road, tire pavement interaction actually governs the wear of a tire and also the wear of a pavement surface. And if you drive a car for maybe 10,000 miles, then you're gonna realize the new tire got completely worn out like this. 
But if you look down the payment surface, you're gonna also realize the payment surface also got polished very badly. And this kind of give you example how we're on these different surfaces for tire and for payment surface. I know many audiences here are the mechanical engineers. So your focus is gonna be probably to design tire has a high wearing resistance. But for our payment engineer or civil engineer, our focus is to develop or design new as for materials has a high abrasion resistance. And so this webinar is gonna give you a new angle to look at this payment material instead of your tire. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Maybe we can have the brainstorm to generate new ideas out of this topic. This slide shows some typical asphalt payment distresses. If you drive on the road, you probably see these distresses. For example, shown here is a rutting issue. And on the raining days for this rut area, the, it's gonna be very easy to accumulate the water and it's very dangerous for driving and has a lot of safety concern. Sometimes you're gonna see the cracks on the road, either it's in the longitudinal direction like this or in the transverse direction, and you know it's bad for payment. Also, you might see the aggregate loss on the surface. We call it a raveling distress, and sometimes due to the insufficient interface bonding, you're gonna see the slippage distress on the surface. And this last photo is kind of the worst damage on the road. It's called a pothole. Uh, it, it's due to the moisture damage. And if you see a hole, a big hole on the road, you know it's very dangerous for your driving and also might cause big damage to your car. And in short, if we see these distresses, then we're gonna realize we have to repair payments in some spots. However, not all the distresses that you can visually observe and know you're gonna repair. Sometimes you're gonna see the problems that you could not see it, for example, like this. For this payment, it looks like very beautiful, very smooth. However, if you drive on it, sometimes it may have a lot of accidents. One potential reason is it, some spots has a very low friction. So if we have a low surface friction, then you're gonna have a longer distance than you expect to fully stop your car. And so that you're gonna have some bad accidents like this. And the key question for us is to identify the spot for these asphalt payments with, without adequate friction. And we have to develop an approach or find an equipment a device to identify this problem. And we know friction is very critical because it's directly related to our safety. And for that, for those of you who are not familiar with our center, National Center for Asphalt Technology, uh, our mission is to provide innovative, relevant, and implementable research, technology development, and education that advances safe, durable, and sustainable asphalt payments. Here I highlighted safe in red here because that can be our key objective in this webinar. As being said, friction is pretty important because it's directly related to driving safety. According to our car accident statistics in 2019, over, over 37,000 people died on the road and about 2.35 million people got injured. And in total, uh, the road crash costs about $230 billion and it's a very big number. If we can improve the friction and we, we can effectively reduce these road crash costs. This following table shows the relationship between payment friction and road accident rates. We can see if the payment friction drops to less than 0.25, we can see the accident rates got exponentially increased. Again, that explains why we want to make sure every payment at every spot has adequate surface friction. After we understanding the importance of friction, then the follow-up question is, what is payment friction? According to Ashton guide for payment friction, its definition is 
the force that resists the relative motion between a vehicle tire and a pavement surface. Here is a schematic plot to show this definition. The friction coefficient is a ratio of friction force divided by the normal weight. It's very similar to another term called rolling resistance. The rolling resistance coefficient is the rolling resistance uh, force divided by the normal weight. The major difference between rolling resistance and pavement friction is when we're talking about friction, we usually talk about the car braking. And when we talk about rolling resistance, um, it's kind of the 40 brake, uh, 40 rotating for the tire. So that's kind of the major difference between these two terms. This slide shows the K payment characteristics affect the different uh, payment functions. We typically divide the payment texture wavelengths into different ranges from micro texture, macro texture, mega texture to roughness or unevenness. We know the micro texture is dependent on aggregate characteristics and the macro texture is more related to surface characteristics of payment. And for these different ranges of texture wavelengths, it can affect the different payment functions. In this webinar, we're gonna more focus on friction. It's dependent on micro texture and a macro texture of payment surface. What is the difference between micro and a macro texture? As showing this uh, figure, we can see micro texture is more related to the surface roughness of the aggregates. And a macro texture is more general. It could depend on the size, the shape of the aggregates, and also the distribution or we call it gradation of the aggregates. Here is a typical asphalt pavement friction performance curve. The horizontal is accumulated traffic and the vertical shows a friction coefficient. It is interesting to see for asphalt pavement, when we start polishing the surface, we did not see an immediate reduction of friction. Actually, we see the friction increase a little bit at the beginning. This is because the asphalt material usually has the asphalt binder coated on the surface. And at the initial polishing, actually we remove this excessive binder. So we have a more angular aggregate surface exposed to the traffic that can enhance or increase the initial friction. But after that, the traffic start to polishing these angular surfaces of aggregate. When we can, then we can see this um, friction got to reduce rapidly to a terminal stage. In the lab, we can simulate this initial kind of stage, but in the long term, we still see this friction got uh, slowly reduced to a steady level. And sometimes for the measurements, we see it goes up and down. This variation comes from either the measurement itself or come from seasonal or temperature effect. But our objective is to understand this friction curve and design the material or surface has adequate long-term friction coefficient. And here are the uh, friction measurements. Typically we divide them into two categories. One is the friction measurement in the field. The other is the friction measurement in the laboratory. In the field, typically we use a lock wheel skate trailer. It's kind of the equipment used by a lot of state highway agencies. And recently, we have some other equipments coming up like the screen or grip tester. And in the laboratory, typically we need a device to simulate the field traffic polishing. And this device calls a three wheel polishing device at each polishing interval, we're gonna use a small device called a dynamic friction tester to measure the surface friction. And for these different devices, they have different mechanisms to measure friction. And as shown here on the right figure, it's a relationship between friction coefficient and sleep rate. I know as a mechanical engineer, probably you know this relationship better than me. But in general, 
when we measure the friction, if as a fully locked stage, which is a 100% steep rate, typically we could not measure the maximum friction. The maximum friction actually is at the slip rate between seven and 20%. That is why for every vehicle, we have the ABS system try to catch up this critical slip and maintain the vehicle as a maximum friction. But for our devices, sometimes the device use a fully locked wheel, sometimes device use a fixed slip, sometimes device try to simulate the ABS system always to measure the uh, the maximum friction. So different devices have the different mechanism and can get the different results. Here is the figure to show the locked wheel ski trailer. It's a commercially available device. Actually, it's much fancier than the uh, conventional uh, trailer because we're also equipped with a texture scanner and the digital imaging system on the top. But our focus is this trailer device. That is a locked wheel ski trailer. And typically we have these um, tire uh, mounted on the left wheel pass, but some states may also mount this tire on the right wheel pass. The reason we, we typically measure is on the left wheel pass is because we think um, the left wheel pass is gonna give us a lower friction and gonna give us a more uh, conservative number because uh, during driving, we feel like the left wheel pass is gonna give us more polishing during the turning. And according to the ASTM standard uh, E274, the testing speed uh, is around 40 miles per hour. And some states might use a smooth tire, some states might use the rib tire, it all depends on the purpose. So if the state agencies require smooth tire means they more care about the influence of micro texture of aggregate on surface friction. Some states might use a rib tire because they are more interested in the influence of micro texture of asphalt pavement surface. So, so, so it all depends on which are the key characteristics you want to uh, focus on or examine and you're gonna choose a different tire type. And also you're gonna realize for this system, we have a water flow nozzle in front. And it can spray the water during measurements. This is because for friction measurements, we typically conducted uh, in wet condition other than dry condition, because we think friction in wet condition is lower, much lower than in dry condition. And it can give us more conservative assessment. And in front is the water tank on the truck. And for this test, it typically is the, uh, it's a discontinuous test, which means at each time we're gonna click the button and fully stop the wheel so we can measure the frictional force. And also we can record the normal force to, to calculate either called the friction coefficient or we can times the coefficient by 100 to get called the skin number. And because of the limit capacity of this water tank for each time, we can only get about 180 drops or clicks for these measurements. Then we have to refill the water. This kind of the limitation of the device. Uh, one is the limited capacity of the water tank. The second is a discontinuous test. Because in the field, we have to identify the friction at every spot so we know which spot has the insufficient friction. This is a new device called a Scream, and you can see it's uh, much bigger than the Lockwood Skate Trader, and it has a GPS link to every measurement, and the testing speed is pretty similar. It's a traffic speed, can vary from uh, 15 to 60 miles per hour, because it has a very giant water tank, so the daily capacity, survey capacity got boomed up a lot. It can range from 200 to 250 miles power. That can make our uh, survey of the friction at every, for every payment possible. Here is another angle to look at this friction measurement device. So uh, different uh, with the Lockwood Ski Trailer. So for this tire, 
uh, it is a, only the smooth tire, always uh, mounted on the left wheel pass. It, uh, for this tire, it has the angle about 20 degrees inclined to the uh, direction, uh, to the uh, driving direction. And this device is not measuring the uh, longitudinal or tangential friction force. Actually, it measures the horizontal or sideways friction force. And this device is not fully locked. Actually, it's free rotating, and it has a system to simulate the ABS system in the car. So basically, it gives us um, a greater friction force than the lockwood skate trailer. It also has the free, uh, water spray on, uh, in front to measure the friction in wet condition. And the major difference for these device is a continuous friction measurement equipment because of the tire is, uh, the wheel is free rotating. So we can get the friction data for every 0.1 meter. By using this device survey on the road, we can identify the spots, the exact spot that has insufficient friction coefficient. This is a third device we used in the field called the grip tester. Uh, it's uh, much smaller than the previous two devices. And also the uh, another major difference is it's a fixed sleep measurement device. And also we uh, told this device at uh, traffic speed, it can give us a continuous friction measurements. Typically this de small device is used in either airport runways or roadways. For airport runway, since it's pretty straight, so we don't have any concern. But if we want to use this small device in the road, we're typically gonna experience some uh, curved sections. And our concern is taking this small device uh, turning around, sometimes we're gonna see that the device uh, fly up a little bit and might cause a safety concern for other vehicles. So we seldom use this device anymore, but we use this device a lot in the airport runways, not on roadways. Except for the field evaluation, we also try to simulate the, the field trafficking or polishing in our laboratory and to try to quantify the friction performance. So here is a device we call a three-wheel polishing device. It's developed at NCAT about 15 years ago. Right now, this device has been implemented in the uh, national standard for evaluation of the friction of asphalt slabs in the lab. And here for this device, we have the motor on the top. It can rotate these uh, wheels. And we have three pneumatic tires uh, polishing these asphalt slabs. We have a water tank at the bottom, so we can circulate in the water on the surface to remove the debris of the polished slabs. As each polishing interval, we use this uh, small device called the dynamic friction tester, and we take the three replic replicates each time, and we can measure the friction coefficient at different speeds. What we typically report is the friction coefficients at 20, 40, and 60 kilometers per hour to quantify the friction performance of different asphalt mixture materials. Here is a typical output of our friction, uh, dynamic friction tester. Uh, here is a result you typically you're gonna see this figure kind of show the relationship between friction coefficient and testing speed. And if you observe this curve, you're gonna realize that if we have a higher testing speed, then we're gonna expect to see a lower friction coefficient. And then we output these data and to quantify the materials friction performance. As been said before, the fr pavement friction is uh, related to the micro and the macro texture of the, of the aggregate characteristics and the surface characteristics of asphalt pavement. So if we want to improve the friction of asphalt pavement surface, then we have the question is, 
what type of surface we're going to select and what type of aggregate we're going to use. Typically, if we have the options like dense graded or open graded asphalt surface, then if we want to have a higher friction, we're going to use open graded because it give us more coarse materials and give us a more uh, or greater micro texture. And sometimes we're going to experience to use a thin overlay or have some special treatment called a high friction surface treatment. And as you can see from the name, this high friction surface treatment is a special treatment can significantly improve the surface friction. And for the aggregate type, we also divide them into two categories. Some aggregates you're gonna expect it has a high wearing resistance. Some aggregates maybe it's very easy to polish. And for these aggregates like uh, calcium bauxite, granite or slag, then we see it has a high wearing resistance. But for the limestone or dolomites, they are pretty soft and very highly polishable. So based on the availability of the aggregates, we have to consider the different combinations of these wearing, wearing resistant materials and high polishable materials and use them as a combination in the asphalt surface mixture. Then we can design the gradation and to select whether we need to use a dense graded or open graded surface mix. Here, I want to briefly talk about two case studies in our center um, regarding the uh, payment friction. So the first study is a friction characteristics for high friction surface treatment with alternative aggregates. The second study we're gonna talk about is uh, evaluate the feasibility of using more dolomite in asphalt surface mixture. So for high friction surface treatment is typically used to enhance the safety at critical locations like bridge decks or horizontal curves. And uh, it's kind of the crushed aggregates bounded on the asphalt pavement surface with a resin binding system. As shown in these figures here, what we did in the field is we first spread this uh, resin binder system on the existing asphalt pavement surface. And then we spread these aggregate chips on the top. After that, we're gonna have an electric power bloom to remove the excessive aggregates. So this treatment can significantly improve the surface friction. But the key question or key trick for this treatment is we have to use a very high wearing resistant aggregates. And typically we use the calcium bauxite. And for this aggregate, we have to import from either China or India that is very expensive. And for this study, we're trying to explore the feasibility of using other alternative aggregates that is locally available to replace this uh, imported calcium bauxite. So at the NCAT test track, we um, build two sections, W8 and W5, both on the curve sections. Um, for majority of friction studies, we use the curve section because the friction is more critical in this area. And for these two sections, we divide into several subsections to evaluate different alternative aggregates like granite, flint, uh, bauxite, slag, and so on. And we select three uh, critical sections, which has a longer section length around 100 feet. And for the rest, we have about 15 feet for each subsection. And here we use the Lockwood scale trailer to measure the friction. And also we bring the laboratory dynamic friction tester to measure the friction also. I want to mention for the Lockwood scale trailer, since it's not continuous measurement, we have kind of the minimum section length for 100 feet to give us a Lockwood scale trailer measurement results. We call the scale number. But in this study, we also managed to get the results for this 85 feet section. So we have three sections with the Lockwood scale trailer results and for uh, all of the sections, so we have the dynamic friction test results. 
So here is the friction ranking we got from this study. We have a variety of alternative aggregates in addition to the calcium bauxite. And also we have the Lockwood scale trailer measurements denoted as SN40R. SN means a scale number, uh, 40 means it measures at 40 miles per hour, R means we use a rib tire other than smooth tire. If we have smooth tire, then we have to change it at S. And for this uh, coefficient number, um, it, from zero to 90, typically if you divide it as 100, then you can get the friction coefficient. On the right axis, we use the dynamic friction test to measure it at 40 kilometer per hour, give us a friction coefficient. And generally the friction coefficient measured in dynamic friction tester can match pretty well with the uh, uh, local scale trailer measurements. And here is the ranking we got for different aggregates. It's not surprising to see the calcium bauxite provided the, the best friction either in terms of the Lockwood scale trailer measurements or from the dynamic friction tester measurements. But interestingly, we find some other alternative aggregates like the slag, teclonite, or even bauxite can also provide us a good friction performance if we use it in the high friction surface treatment. So this information is very useful for our decision makers. Like if they're gonna select the high friction surface treatment, but if they have limited budget for this treatment, they may consider use some alternative aggregates to replace the expensive uh, calcium bauxite. And the second case study is what we did for uh, another agency, uh, West Virginia Division of Highways. And in West Virginia, they have a lot of dolomite aggregates, which is a very, uh, it's highly polishable. And they consider to use more of these polishable aggregates in asphalt mixture to reduce the cost. According to West Virginia standard specification, uh, for asphalt surface pavement, if the projected traffic is very high, then the dolomite content shall not exceed 50% of their cost aggregate in surface mix. Here, the cost aggregate means the aggregate size greater than 4.75 millimeter. And so in this study, we want to challenge this threshold a little bit, try to increase the dolomite limit. And we built two sections at our test track for section W4, we use 70% dolomite and W5, we use 90% dolomite in cost aggregate for asphalt surface mixture. And then uh, we run this friction for uh, performance about for about two years. Here is the friction results. The horizontal axis is accumulated traffic and vertical axis shows a skin number. Uh, we also use a rib tire for this measurement. You can see as a beginning, the friction or uh, the skin number is pretty good, but it reduced very rapidly for the first one minute ESOs of polishing. Then it reduced to a shroud below 30. This 30 is kind of the uncut test track safety shroud. And you, you can see when we continue polishing using the heavy track for this skin number reduced to even 25. So this 25 is kind of equal to the friction coefficient around 0.25. If you remember or recall the first table we, we show, if, if the payment friction reduced to 0.25, we can see the car accident rates on the road got exponentially increased. So this is a very critical information for us. It means we have to do something or we could not use this material for the long term. Even though we see this friction goes up a little bit, but it's not because of materials getting better. It's basically because of the influence of seasonal effect or the temperature effect. Typically, we're gonna to expect to see a, a higher friction when we're testing at a lower temperature. So from this study, we kind of concluded we could not use 70 or 90% dolomite to achieve adequate or good uh, friction performance in the long term, or at least it might be, be 
worse than this 50% dolomite. Then with this question, we kind of developed a laboratory study to evaluate the influence of dolomite con content on our friction performance of asphalt mixture. So we fabricated different, a lot of slabs with different combination of dolomite content from 0% to even 90% dolomite. And we use the three-wheel polishing device to polish, uh, breathe these uh, slabs. And then we use a dynamic friction test to measure the friction at each uh, polishing intervals to generate these curves. And we use two parameters to quantify this friction performance. The first is the polishing rate or the friction deterioration rate in this stage. We do not want to get a high friction polishing rate. And the second parameter is a terminal friction coefficient. We expect the material has higher terminal friction uh, coefficient that provides adequate long-term friction in the field. So here is the influence of the dolomite content on these two parameters. The left figure shows the influence of dolomite content on uh, uh, polishing rate or uh, friction deterioration rate. We clearly see if we increase the dolomite content, we see um, an accelerate of deterioration rate at the initial stage. It is bad for our material. But interestingly, for the terminal friction coefficient, we see if we increase the dolomite content to greater than 50%, we see a big reduction of the terminal friction. But if we hold the dolomite content not greater than 50%, the terminal friction keeps very steady and greater than 0.3. And it's kind of the critical value for us to evaluate the material, whether it has adequate friction or not. So based on this study, we kind of concluded if we increase the dolomite content uh, greater than 50%, we do not expect to see um, good long-term friction in the field. And also it kind of explains why West Virginia Division of Highway limited the dolomite content as 50% uh, for asphalt surface mixture. In addition, this study also uh, confirmed that our laboratory through wall polishing device is capable of simulating the field traffic, traffic polishing. And we can use this laboratory approach to uh, quickly or conveniently evaluate the friction performance in the long term. And recently, the Federal Highway Administration is implementing a friction management program. I want to talk about this a little bit in this webinar. Um, FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, implemented this pro pro program is try to ensure for every new payment surfaces we can design, construct, and maintain them to provide adequate and durable friction properties. And also we have to identify and crack those sections have very bad crash rate or very uh, high accident rate. And also we want to prioritize the use of our, our resources or budgets to reduce these friction related crashes in a cost effective manner. And lastly, I think most importantly is that we have to collect, effectively collect and analyze the payment friction and also correlate them with uh, crash and traffic data to eventually reduce friction crashes. And I think it is pretty important, which means we have to uh, collect the friction or measure the payment friction for every payment, every spot. And in the future, we have to develop device or equipment to achieve this goal. If not, I believe we have to find other helpers like these, these guys, little animals to help us identify the payment friction problems. So with that said, that's all my um, presentation. If you have any questions, yeah, please let us know. Thank you, Fab. great job. Uh... So if you want, you can type your uh, questions into the chat and I'll try to get to them. There's not too many, maybe I'll unmute everybody, but uh, yeah, Fan, were both these uh, tests done at uh, on the NCAT track? Yes. Yeah, okay. So 
for those of you who don't know, there's a 1.7 mile trek. Um, it's near I-85 in, in Alabama, or it's off I-85 in Alabama, and uh, this track where they have trucks uh, riding around this oval many hours a day to, uh, wearing down the, uh, the asphalt. Um, so uh, another question we have found is, uh, how does one balance the economics of the aggregate costs with the cost of increased higher wear associated with the use of aggregates of higher Mohs hardness? Yeah, I appreciate this question. First, I want to yeah, give the audience ask the question about NCAT test track, this sure, yeah, uh, yeah. overview. So you can see this is kind of the track we have. Uh, it's kind of, as um, Dr. Jackson uh, mentioned, it's an uh, over section and we have about uh, uh, 2.7 miles, uh, 1.7 miles uh, in total. And we divide this section into uh, 46 sections. Some sections we evaluate the surface characteristics. Some sections we evaluate the, the, the structural performance, which means we're gonna instrument it, the, the, uh, the stress gauges, sensors or string sensors or temperature gauges inside of the pavement to get the responses of pavement uh, to sub when it's subject to traffic loading. And for the friction studies, the majority of the friction studies done in these curve sections as shown here, because as being said, it's more critical to friction. And so for the West Virginia study, W4 and W5 is around this spot. And for the federal highway, uh, high friction surface treatment study is around this spot. And regarding the question about the cost effectiveness of aggregate and also the vehicle, uh, operation costs. I want to know, uh, Mike, do you have any comments for this? I want to ask for your opinion first. Yes, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Heitzman. As Dr. Jackson had introduced me earlier on, uh, the question is quite keen in that, what is the cost effectiveness of safety? And every agency is going to have a little different perspective as to how much money uh, they feel is necessary to maintain safety. If uh, you took the absolute uh, extreme of that process, the high friction surface treatment would be placed everywhere, but is an extremely, extremely costly surface to place. So agencies do have to balance uh, the amount of safety risk that they uh, have on their pavements compared to uh, possibly changing or going to a higher type friction surface. So do we have any other questions? Let's see, oh, here's one. Um, how, yeah, how do you separate this from the same uh, attendee, Larry Beaver, he's actually on our board as well. Uh, how do you separate friction related crash data from crashes associated with other causes such as visibility, weather, et cetera. <clears throat> yes, and in fact, uh, the uh, highway patrol, uh, the law enforcement, when they do come onto a crash scene, they do measurements relevant to the vehicle dynamics uh, of that crash. And uh, over time, many crashes can uh, be uh, can be uh, determined to be either related to pavement friction or not. In most cases, those related to pavement friction are going to be in uh, horizontal curves uh, or may be due to rear end accidents, particularly in wet weather conditions. We have a lot of questions that rolled in here. Uh, do you perform testing to estimate different weather's effects like snow or ice affecting friction or pavement life? All of the testing done by the agencies and by NCAT and other researchers, uh, the standards for friction testing are done on a wet surface. And from a turbology perspective, that's basically what we consider the lubrication. Uh, so uh, as far as ice goes, no, that's an entirely different animal. and. Uh, you leave that up to the winter maintenance crews to keep the ice off the pavement. 
Okay, that, there's another question about that. And I think you kind of answered it, just how the these conditions affect the friction. Uh, someone just thank you for the presentation. Uh, how do we use animals to identify friction problems? <laughs> so I think that was a joke, but uh, I don't know if, if you have any comment on that. Um, what effect have you found of tire durometer versus temperature as it relates to the friction coefficient? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, FAN has actually been working uh, on a study with uh, the manufacturers of the scrim. Uh, but uh, in my years of studying this, what's quite interesting, and it's almost counterintuitive, is that uh, the warmer the tire, the lower the friction. And that uh, is kind of counter to what you might think about if you see the racetrack drivers when they get the new tires on the cars the first thing they do is is go side to side to essentially warm up those tires but all of the results that we have seen with typical pavements not uh, test track or with uh, not racetrack um, type surfaces is that we see higher friction values in the colder temperatures and lower friction values in the higher temperatures. That's interesting. Uh, another question, um, what do you consider the approximate cutoff between micro and macro texture? And what is the difference between the aggregates, the roughness, size and shape? What's the main difference, I guess, they're asking? So, um, um, the the struggle between micro. If you look at the um, uh, pavement surface uh, texture wavelengths, uh, we typically consider if it's a below 0.5 millimeter um, wavelength, then it's the micro texture. If it's 0.5 to 5 millimeter range, we call it a macro texture. And for the aggregate, the difference between aggregate uh, uh, surf roughness and the, the size of the aggregate. Um, so the aggregate micro texture or roughness is more related to the single material. And uh, it's not related, it's nothing related to the, the size or the shape. Maybe, uh, but for the micro texture, since it's a combination of the material, we look at it in a bigger range. So this kind of the size or the shape gonna affects these uh, surface micro texture. Okay, um, this is someone from Germany. I think they have, looks like they have more experience with this because they ask uh, any data or comparison between the frictional properties of dense graded mixes, super pave, OGFC, SMA. Yeah. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Yeah, that's a very good question, Horst. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, we have a lot of study as a test track. We've collected the friction data from uh, early 2000 to now for so more than probably 15 years history. And we have different surface types on our test track, uh, varying from dense gradient mix to OGFC and also um, to uh, SMA. It's a special asphalt surface mix type for those uh, mechanical engineers who are not familiar with this. And we do have the data to compare uh, the different asphalt surface type and we have the uh, data to back up the difference uh, of the surface type, how those type surface type gonna affect our friction coefficient. Also, if you are interested in this data, we can definitely talk about it later on. And uh, Fan, Fan let me go ahead and, and add to that uh, okay. because the question is talking about mixture types, which for the most part will impact the macro texture of the pavement surface. Okay. Assuming all of these mixtures have the same aggregates, the macro texture will influence the friction. But if in fact the dense graded mixture has a different aggregate from the open graded friction course, then the characteristics of the aggregate will probably dominate how the friction properties change. Uh, someone also asked about um, the 2019 statistics for deaths, injuries, and cost 
uh, for friction related for potholes or other, I'm trying to figure out what the question is saying. Are the, are the statistics related to friction, potholes, substandard conditions or all incidents? Um, it's all incidents. Yeah. It does not differentiate the different payment distresses. Uh, also from Germany, uh, any differences when using different top size aggregates? I think you kind of already touched on that. Um, Mike, have you started this? <clears throat> Yes, the difference in the top size aggregate certainly influences the macro texture. And within the United States, uh, a lot of interest in going to very fine mixtures, which we call 4.75 millimeter mixtures, uh, because the top size of that mixture is so small, uh, we lose a lot of the macro texture, which we need to uh, address the wet condition of the pavement uh, during uh, braking action. Not sure if you can answer this one. This one has to deal with the snow, but uh, what different states allow snow chains, with different states allowing snow chains, does this different type of wear on the pavement go under consideration when deciding the types of material used in the asphalt to try to minimize the degradation? Yes, it is. And for the states that do have uh, tire chains, uh, their perceptions of what are important for that pavement surface are certainly different than if you were in Florida or Alabama. Surprisingly, uh, what I have heard uh, from talking with those up north is that they tend to go with larger aggregate sizes in the mixtures in order to help resist the the uh, snow chains. Interesting. Uh, that's most of our questions. I have one more uh, thought I wrote down at the beginning. You mentioned the uh, $230 billion cost um, due to the accidents and, and you know, a large portion of that is due to the friction. And uh, for, you know, for a while, uh, well, the reason we call friction aware tribology is because uh, a gentleman was uh, given the task in England to do a report, uh, Peter Joseph's name, to do a report on the cost of friction and wear to the country. And I don't, I don't know if anybody's included road wear, or, you know, this is these kind of associated costs in that calculation. So you, know, you, you keep learning about all these different areas that tie into it. And um, you know, friction and wear have a huge economic impact uh, in the country. And um, so I think it's great what you guys are going doing. Any other questions? Um, Dr. Jackson, I think that's a good comment. But for our uh, payment engineer, the Federal Highway Administration did a study to evaluate, quantify the cost related to friction. So it's more critical yeah. to our payment engineers, but not for mechanics. Yeah, no, engineers. that's good. I mean, it's just like these different fields. Uh, no one's taking a very big view, I think, of like all the friction all the way across different industries. You kind of get separated into different sub areas. Um, so there's an, one more question here. If you're, you're still all right with doing, having a few more questions, do you still want a few more questions? Um, we have Looks a like, meeting at two, so yeah. yeah. All think. right, let's do one more. Um, Ever thought about the contact points between tires and road surfaces when looking at frictional op or properties? Look at the studies of Professor Woodside at University of Ulster. Mike, uh, I think that's a good question. I think it's more related to the modeling, the numerical modeling of the payment, um, payment friction or a tire payment interaction. But for our study, more focus on the, the field measurements and laboratory testing in this webinar. So we did not uh, evaluate the contact points between tire and road surface. Mike, do you have anything to add? No, there is certainly a, uh, on a very microscopic scale, there is interest in how the tire uh, not only adheres to the aggregate, but also moves around the aggregate. Uh, from a very practical standpoint, however, uh, we as highway engineers cannot dictate the conditions of the tires that are going across the pavements. So we don't have that luxury of 
of defining exactly uh, that part of the uh, measure of friction. And I would say uh, for many, um, many I'm sure on this webinar, uh, Dr. Fangu's presentation probably turned all of your thoughts upside down because here we are looking for more friction, not less friction. Uh, we are looking, we are certainly looking for uh, at how the aggregates do wear because we know they're gonna wear over time. And for us, lubrication, which is uh, the rain coming down is a problem for us as opposed to something that you would use to help solve your problem. Yeah, that's a good, another great point. 